Isaiah 1 18, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. The word of the Lord today reads, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Then we jump into the New Testament. The Apostle Peter writes in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Praise the name of the Lord. Come now, God says through the prophet Isaiah, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Some would argue that faith and reason have no relationship one with the other. However, if the truth be told today, we all reason with our faith. We all reason out our faith. Some will find a reason to believe in something so simple as the faith of their parents. Well, I believe because my parents believed. I go to church because my parents went to church. I believe in God because my parents believe in God. Well, first of all, if that's the best reason you have for believing, then there's a good chance you don't really believe. Amen. You see, if the only reason you embrace something is because your mom and your dad or your grandma and your grandpa embraced it, then there really doesn't have to to be any genuine faith in you concerning that message or that truth. No, you're just kind of going along with the program. So you cannot piggyback on the back of someone else's faith. Amen. If you're going to possess faith, if you're going to possess the faith that is able to save your soul, you have better have reasons to believe that go beyond, well, my mother believed, my grandmother believed, my father believed, and what have you. So some will find a reason to believe simply in the fact that their parents or others believe, while others look upon their own experiences and their own relationship with faith. It is foolishness today in many uh, agnostics and many atheists that I know will suggest that people believe in absence of all reason. I just love when non-believers, you know, try to say, well, you know, that religion business, that faith business... Why, you've got to throw all reason out the window. You cannot employ reason and still believe in God and still believe in creation and still believe in Jesus Christ. Like, the minute you employ reason, then all these things go out the window. Uh, no. Wrong. The truth of the matter is, in order to believe, we all must first, listen to me now, Find reasons to believe. Now the word reasons comes from the noun or the verb reason. We find reasons. Well, what does that mean? That means we've reasoned it out. When we say I have a reason, I have reason to believe, that means I've reasoned this out. And this conclusion is my quote-unquote reason. The reason is simply the byproduct of our reasoning. You'll notice in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 that God calls man to reason. He doesn't just say, believe me because I say so. <laughs> 
He said, come, let us reason together. He said, come here. Let me help you understand. I'm going to help you reason this out. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to help you come to an understanding so that you have reasons to believe me and to trust me. Then in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, the apostle Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, listen, a reason of the hope that is in you. Sounds to me like Peter was saying, we employ reason. Because you cannot have a reason without having first reasoned it out. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So Peter says, have an answer when someone asks you, how can you have a hope of salvation? How can you have a hope of redemption? How can you have a hope of heaven? How can you have a hope of the rapture? You have a reason. You've reasoned it out. There are legitimate reasoning skills that have been employed that have helped you to come to this conclusion that this truth, this promise, this hope is something you genuinely can stand upon. I have a brother right now who is trying to go the way of the atheist, I say he's trying because to be honest, I believe he's fighting God in his spirit, but he doesn't want to admit that and he doesn't want to acknowledge that. But my brother will say, well, you know, the only reason people believe this stuff is because they're raised and they're taught these things. Well, now that isn't true. There are many people who are raised in church. There are many people who go through years of religious training and years of Sunday school. Many go through years of uh, private education and religious uh, schools. And as they arrive into adulthood, they find reasons to abandon any faith and they leave their religion. They leave their faith. They're no longer interested in it. They no longer embrace it. So to suggest that the only reason people believe something is because they were raised to believe that. Um, I was raised to believe in Santa Claus, but I outgrew Santa Claus. I was raised to believe in the Easter money, but I've outgrown the Easter money. Do you hear what I'm telling you? I was raised to believe in the tooth fairy, but honey, I don't still believe in the tooth fairy. Do you understand what I'm telling you? No, at some point you reason things out and you determine reasons for no longer believing in these things. But Peter said, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Some people today believe that there is a very high likelihood that the universe is so vast and limitless that surely we cannot be the only planet with life on it. Do you know people who believe that? Do you know people who will tell you, well, it's impossible for me to imagine that with as many planets as there are in the universe, as many stars, as many light years as one can travel, it is hard for me to fathom that we would be the only life in the entirety of the universe. And they believe this with every ounce of conviction. And you just heard their reasoning. Why do they believe this? Well, they believe this based on the vastness of the universe, the multitude of stars, the multitude of planets. Now, is that the most scientific reasoning that one could employ? I personally don't think so. 
See, reasoning isn't always about... See, the atheists, let me back up a second. The atheists try to tell you that those of us with faith in God employ no reason. Well, that is incorrect. We may reason things differently than they do. But that doesn't mean we haven't reasoned it. Amen. Right, right. You see, those, for instance, who would say, well, the universe is so vast and the universe is so enormous, surely there's life out there. Well, they're basing their reasoning on one line of thought. I look at it and I say, now, wait a minute. Scientists claim that the universe came into existence in response to a big bang. And that the earth was formed and all life on earth came into existence by some kind of freak accident. All of a sudden, all of the ingredients necessary for the first cell to be born into existence, for the first atom to be created by natural causes in order for all life forms to spring forth from that one singular beginning. And they will tell you that the chances of this occurring are so astronomical that it's like one in a quadrillion billion that all of these things could happen to come into existence, could all happen to occur at the same time, that could all happen to happen all at once. And they'll tell you this, Tommy. Well, now, my reasoning skills tell me if that is true, then what are the likelihood, what are the chances that that could happen twice? Mm -hmm. Do you follow what I'm saying? Right. What are the chances that that same perfect mix of soup could occur twice in all of the universe? If the chances for all these conditions being perfect we know that the earth is in what they refer to as a sweet spot or a sweet zone in the universe. Were the earth any closer to the sun or were the earth any further removed from the sun, it would not be able to sustain life. It happens to be in the perfect spot in the universe so that the heat and the light of the sun are perfect to help create uh, life on planet Earth. And we know that all the conditions for atmosphere in this particular orbit of the sun is perfect. What are the chances that that perfect set of circumstances could just happen to happen elsewhere in the universe? Do you follow what I'm saying? Right. Now, the people who believe that there's life out there elsewhere and there are other planets that support life, are they without reason? No, they're employing reason. They have their reasons for believing what they believe. I have my reasons for believing what I believe. So, Mr. Atheist, Mr. Unbeliever, Mr. Agnostic, don't be a fool and look at me and say that because I believe in God and I believe in creation and I believe in Jesus Christ and I believe in Calvary and I believe in the empty tomb, don't you stand there and tell me that I am without reason for believing so. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? No, sir, I do have reasons. And today I'm talking about the reasons I believe. Hallelujah. In John chapter 4 and verse 29, we read the story of the woman at the well who had a conversation with Jesus, not knowing who he was, but speaking with him and her experience with him was so powerful and so miraculous that according to her own testimony, she believed on him 
Why? Because he was able to tell her of her very personal life circumstances, which he could not possibly have known anything about. How do we know this is why she believed? Well, in John chapter 4, verse 29, this woman goes back to her community, and this was her testimony. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? She had reasons for believing. She didn't simply believe because Jesus said, believe on me. And she said, okay. People sit in churches every day. People make decisions to follow Jesus Christ. People make decisions to believe on the gospel. And I assure you, every one of those people has a reason. We're not just doing it to do it. The preacher, if all I had to do to get you to believe the gospel today was stand up and say, believe. And just because you heard me say that, you automatically go, bing, I believe, we. It doesn't work that way. Every one of us, somewhere in our journey, there are some people who will hear hundreds of preachers in their lifetime. And they'll never believe the gospel. And then all of a sudden, they'll hear one preacher, and that one preacher will say one thing that suddenly triggers a thought process that suddenly appeals, listen to me now, to their reason. And they will say, wait a minute, I get that. That, that speaks to me. That says something to me. That falls in line with my reason name. Do you hear what I'm saying? And they find a reason to believe. I'm going to tell you, the more you know about the Word of God, the more you know about Jesus Christ, the more you know about the history of the church, the more you know about the Christian faith, I'm going to tell you something, the harder and harder it will become for you to reason it away. I love people who tell me the Bible is just a man-made document. It is just a book written by men. Yeah, you said it all right. It is a book written by men. Men. Multitude. Plural. It is not a book that was written by a man. Uh, when you get into a religion that bases its belief system on documents which have all been penned by the same man, uh, I'd worry. We've got Scientology. We've got the Scientologist, L. Ron Hubbard. All these aliens came from outer space, and they dumped a bunch of spirit beings into volcanoes. This is what he literally taught. This is what... Tom Cruise and his bunch of nuts believe. Oh, then you've got others. Oh, Joseph Smith is our great prophet. Joseph Smith revealed to us another testament of Jesus Christ. Um, funny, because God did not give us one prophet in the Old Testament. He gave us many prophets. The word of God declares, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word, without exception, shall every word be established. God employs a law. God employs a rule that in order for something to be established, it must come from more than two witnesses. Therefore, had there been a Joseph Smith in America and a Joseph Smith, say, somewhere in England or somewhere in Japan or somewhere in China who were saying the same thing at the same time, then I would have to give their, uh, what they have to say, a lot more weightiness. But when you have one man Stands up and declares, and then he writes book after book after book, The Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, The Book of Mormon, and it's all written by one singular man. That's not our Bible. 
The Bible is not a book written by men. The Bible is a collection of documents which were penned by human beings, yes. But it is a collection of documents. All of these men who wrote the various books, what we call books of the Bible, all of these men lived in, in different times. They lived in different countries. They lived under different circumstances. They lived under different governments and different societies. And yet, there is a congruity that goes through the entire Word of God. You read about a prophecy here that a man made thousands of years ago, and then history tells us that that prophecy indeed came to pass. And exactly what that man said hundreds of years before it happened, exactly what that man said then turned around and came to pass at a later date. And we have a collection of prophets, and we have a collection of prophecies. We have a collection of history. People say, well, you know, the Jewish faith, uh, well, that's just a bunch of bunk because we don't have a lot of secular uh, historians who support a lot of what they wrote. No, but Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's what we call uh, the Pentateuch. And he gave us a history of the Jewish race, the Jewish family, the Jewish nation. And then throughout that history that Moses gave us, many of those prophets who wrote also, they lived during various times in this history. And we read them supporting and endorsing many of the things that Moses wrote about. Do you follow what I'm saying today? So we have more than one voice. We have more than one witness. You understand the Bible, I'm going to tell you, when you begin to understand that God gives names to things, every time God does something, He either gave it a name or He changed its name. When God was going to give uh, Abraham a son, He changed the man's name. The, name. the man's name was Abram, A-B-R-A-M. But He changed it to Abraham, which meant the father of many nations, but wait a minute, his wife wasn't even pregnant yet, but God changed his name. Why? Because God is very specific. Nothing, there is not, let me tell you, there is not one accidental thing in God. Not one single accidental thing. Sarah wasn't even pregnant yet, and God is already calling him Abraham. Say, okay, well, big deal. Oh, it is a big deal. Jesus' prophecy said that Jesus would be born in the city of Bethlehem of Judea. Bethlehem means the house of bread. Jesus declares, I am the bread which has come down from heaven. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. At the Last Supper, he said, take, eat. He broke the bread. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. The bread represented his body. And he was born of all the places. He could have been born in Jerusalem, the capital of Judaism. But he wasn't. He was born in the house of bread. When you read the names of cities and towns and places where various occurrences occurred within the Word of God, and you look into their meaning in the original tongue, you will find a depth of understanding that you cannot even fathom. Because every 
single word of scripture. There is some enormous significance in every title, in every name, in every name of every town, in every name of every city where things occur. Even in the story of Elijah and Elijah, when Elisha would ask Elijah, if he could go with him, and Elijah would say, well, listen, I'm heading to this place. If you want to go along with me, you could go. And if you look into the meaning of the names of each place that Elijah was going to, there was significance in that story. Oh, I'm going to tell you, folks, by the time you understand the Word of God, by the time you understand this faith, by the time you understand this gospel, you will understand that there are many, many reasons to believe. Hallelujah. Nathaniel believed on the Lord Jesus Christ because the Lord told him of seeing him, Nathaniel, before they had even met. In John chapter 1, 44 through 50, the Word of God said, Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? So Nathanael was kind of a smart aleck. Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him. This is Jesus speaking of Nathanael to Nathanael. Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Since when do you know me? How do you know I'm an Israelite? in whom there is no guile. Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Woo. For those of you who don't think Jesus was God, for those of you who think Jesus was just a man, how could Jesus be a man over here? Nathaniel's a man over there. And as Nathaniel's approaching him, the Lord says to him, Oh, you know what? Before Philip got to you, I saw. Woo, hallelujah. He said, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. I saw you. How does this man, how do you see me anywhere? The only place you've ever seen me is coming up to you on this road. How in the world could you possibly have seen me sitting under the fig tree? Verse 49, Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Hallelujah. Because Nathaniel had a reason to believe. Jesus demonstrated his identity to Nathaniel. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Jesus demonstrated his divinity to, to, to Nathaniel. And this is why Nathaniel believed. But Nathaniel did not believe without reason. Got news for you today, folks. I do not believe this gospel today without reason. John testified that in fact, the Lord knew the hearts and minds of all people, and he therefore never required that anyone fill him in on anyone or offer him a reference or, or a referral on their behalf. Did you hear what I just said? John said that Jesus never needed anybody to tell him about anybody. He never needed anybody to give him a referral. He never needed anybody to 
Give him a recommendation. Well, Lord, now this is a good man. This man here, he gives to charity. He does this. He does. The Word of God through, through John tells us Jesus never required anyone. Listen. John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus, listen, did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Many believed on him, but the Lord didn't set up camp and establish a church because he knew exactly what the quality of these people. There's a lot of people that believe on the Lord at a very superficial level. Why did these people believe? Because they saw the miracles he did. But that's as deep as their faith went. That was as much reasoning as they employed. That's all the reasons for believing that they had. I've seen him perform miracles. Well, there were fakes and phonies in biblical times who could perform fake miracles, just like we have magicians in our world today who through sleight of hand can make you believe that something supernatural and something magical has transpired. There were magicians in biblical times, and the Lord knew it. Hey, honey, if miracles is the only reason you believe on me, then you're not believing on me because you have enough reasons. Don't forget, the Word of God tells us as Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem on Good Friday and people were throwing palms in the streets and he rode upon the back of the colt of an ass. The Word of God tells us there were thousands cheering and yelling and screaming and celebrating his entry into Jerusalem. And the Word of God says why they were shouting and yelling. Because of the miracles they had seen Jesus perform. Mm -hmm. These are the same exact people who very shortly thereafter are going to be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Because they're that easily moved. Their, their minds are that easily changed by the doubts and the thoughts planted in their hearing by the priests and the high priests. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? And Jesus knew that. He didn't commit himself unto these people because he knew their hearts. He knew the depth of their faith. He knew exactly what was going on in their mind. He never needed anybody. To, I don't need you to tell me about John Smith. I don't need you to tell me about Tommy. I don't need you to tell me about Charles. Believe me, I know more about him. I got news for you today, honey, if you're watching this video right now, if you're watching this broadcast. God knows you better than you know yourself. God don't need Billy Graham. He don't need Franklin Graham. He don't need Jimmy Swagger. He don't need anybody to fill him in on where your heart and your mind is at. God knows your heart and your mind. So you ought to be able to go to bed tonight with hope of salvation and assurance of our coming redemption because God knows. As long as God knows I could care less whether Franklin Graham ever gets me or not. Many believed on the Lord simply because they had seen him perform miracles in John chapter 2 and verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. So they believed in his name because they saw miracles. But seeing the Lord perform miracles, listen to me now, did not guarantee that one would believe. For in John chapter 12 verse 37, the word of God said, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. So see, some believed because they saw miracles. Others saw miracles, and yet they did not believe. So 
to reason that seeing a miracle automatically creates a believer is also false. No, because each individual must reason for themselves. That's why God said, come, let us reason together. It's a personal thing. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. The Word of God said, Let every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. It is a one-on-one -on -one thing. It is a personal relationship. It is a personal understanding. It is a personal revelation. So, you can't piggyback on the back of somebody else because God didn't reason it out with them so that you could say, yeah, I believe what they believe. No, no, no. God says to you today, come, let us reason together. Let me give you reasons to trust me. Let me give you reasons to believe me. Let me give you reasons. I remember a man in the Riverside Church of God, a marvelous Christian man, an incredible Christian man, Brother Dewey King. I mentioned his name today in memory. He has passed on to his reward. If there's ever a man of God, if ever there's a Christian man that walked and lived the Christian faith, I believe Brother Dewey King and his wife, uh, were they were just some of the most incredible people you've ever met in your life. Brother King had, I believe it was a sister and brother-in-law or brother and sister-in-law who were Pentecostal people. And this is back in the 1950s or so. And Brother King was not a Christian. He was not a believer. He had no interest in things of God or things of faith. This is what he said. One day he was driving down the highway at a very high rate of speed. And his young son, this is back in the day of course, before child proof door locks on back doors. And in his sedan, his young son, who at the time I believe was just like three or four or something like that, he grabbed hold of the handle of the car door and he pulled it and it opened and he fell out onto the highway going at a very high rate of speed. Well, of course, Brother King come to a swift stop and he ran back and he grabbed hold of his son and they took him to the hospital and the doctors told him that this boy had experienced major trauma. He'd experienced major head damage. He'd experienced major internal damage. There was no possibility in the world that he would live, that they needed to get ready to bury him, pick out a suit because this child was not going to survive. Brother King said, I found a quiet place. And I said, God, you know, my family says you're up there. My family tells me that you're a miracle worker. Jesus, my family tells me that you can do things. And no, see, the Bible said, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible tells us that if we're to come to God, we must first believe that He is. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You see, Brother King didn't believe the gospel, but Brother King had some sense that God was there anyway. I'm going to tell you a little secret today. If you've got enough sense in your head today to reason that God is there, then you've got all you need for God to reveal Himself to you and to show Himself to you if you'll give Him an opportunity. Brother King said, Lord, my family tells me you're a miracle worker. They've told me of things you've done that were miraculous and powerful. Well, right now I'm in a pickle. My son is dying. The doctors give him no hope. And I'm turning to you. And God, if you'll heal my son, I will go to the house of God and I will serve you until the day I die. Guess what happened? His son was touched by the hand of God. He miraculously survived. Brother King and his wife found their way to the Riverside Church of God. He received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Brother King was buried in a Pentecostal church. Hallelujah. And I'm telling you, a man full of the Holy Ghost, a man that lived the Christian life with more sincerity and more love and more grace, and more, even after I came out, and even after my life had taken such changes, I had Tommy met him, and we had the opportunity to spend time in his presence. 
And Brother King was so loving. He and his wife were so loving to me and so sweet to me. At one point I said to him, I said, Brother King, I have always believed that you and Sister King were top shelf, that you were cream of the crop. Brother King looked at me, a big smile on his face, and if you knew him, he was very soft-spoken, very mild-mannered. And he looked at me and he said, Chuck, he said, we've always believed that you're top shelf too. Never a mean word, never a malicious word came out of that man's mouth. I never heard him. I wished I had his personality. I wished I had Brother King's temperament. Unfortunately, I grew up in a different home and in a different environment than he did, I guess. I don't know. But Brother King had reason to believe. He asked God to touch his son, and God touched his son. But is that the only reason for the king believe? No, 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 no. No. As the years went by, God revealed himself to Brother King over and over and over again. Hallelujah. God answered prayer. God spoke to him in times of trouble. God gave him peace in the midst of the storm. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 25, the word of God said, I applied mine heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom and the reason of things and to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness, even of foolishness, and madness. I applied my heart to know. You see, you're never going to find reasons. You're never going to reason something if you don't try to reason it out. If you think you're going to, that reasons are just going to drop into your life and drop into your head, if you think you're suddenly just going to believe in God because poof, it happened, it doesn't work that way. At some point, the Word of God said, in the day that you seek me with all of your heart, I will be found of you. God says, the minute that you want to come to the table and reason with me, I'll give you reasons to believe in me. I'll reason with you. I'll help you understand some things. But you see, people who don't believe in God and who don't want to believe in God, they avoid even reasoning out the matter. They avoid even thinking or putting too much thought into the matter. Because if they put any kind of thought into the matter whatsoever they know good and well, they're going to find reasons to believe. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Mark chapter 2, verses 3 through 12, And they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four, carried by four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there, listen to the next phrase, and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins? But God only. And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Now who can forgive sins? God alone. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed 
and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Many today will refuse to believe, regardless of what they see or what they experience. They find fault, and they pick apart everything. They'll constantly seek reasons not to embrace faith in God rather than to do so. I want to tell you today the reasons that I believe. I believe because the Christian faith is not an issue. It's not a fairy tale book that we're told believe in the three little pigs, believe in Cinderella, believe in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Believe in this story. Believe in that story. No, no, no. Uh, I don't know about you people that were born and raised in the Episcopal faith and in the uh, uh, Church of Christ and Baptist and Presbyterian and all those others. But honey, this boy grew up in the old time Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, fire baptized Pentecostal church. I heard as a child that not only does God save you when you embrace faith and trust Him and obey the gospel, but he fills you with this great Holy Ghost in order to seal the deal. And when he fills you with the Holy Ghost, you begin, like they did in biblical times, you begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. And God filled me with the Holy Ghost. I'll never forget it so long as I live. I was about five years old. And Brother Kautz, I don't remember his first name, but his last name was Kautz. I remember he was of German descent. Uh, his name sounded like Couch, but it was Couts. I think it was K-O-U-T-Z or something. He was preaching, and he was preaching on the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And I went down to that altar as a kid, and I remember God filling me with the Holy Ghost. And I remember speaking with other tongues, speaking in another language that I did not know was not somebody speaking through me. It was not something speaking through me. I was speaking. I was the one. My voice was employed, but I was speaking another language. Five years old. Well, I was young. I didn't understand how to operate in the gift of the Spirit, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. When I got to be about 12 years old, I wanted the Lord to... I, the term they used in the Assemblies of God back then, which is a doctrinally incorrect term, because the Word of God said once God fills you with the Holy Ghost, you're filled, and that filling will never leave you. You can backslide and leave God. You can leave... Uh, you can walk away from the church. You can walk away from your faith. But honey, if God ever filled you with the Holy Ghost, the Lord said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Ghost, He said, would be with us to the end of the world. World. There isn't a thing in the world you can do. There isn't a place in the world you can go. There is not anything you can possibly embrace that will force the Spirit of God to leave you once God's filled you with His great Holy Ghost. But the term the Assemblies of God used to use was refill, as if God, as if your Holy Ghost filling ran out and you needed to go back to the gas station and get refilled. Well, the way the Apostle Paul describes it is, Stir up the gift of God that is within you by the laying on of hands of the presbytery. In other words, it's not about refilling, but it's about if there's crust that is growing over the top of the water that doesn't allow the well to flow freely, then break up that crust. Amen. Break up that lime crust. Break up that hard water crust so that the water can flow freely. So I was really needing God to help me stir up the gift, but I was saying, Lord, refill me, refill me. And I went down to the altar at the church I grew up in. And I would say, Lord, refill me with the Holy Ghost. Refill me. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. And a voice spoke to me, not an audible voice, but spoke in my spirit and said, Before I can do that, you must stop hating your father. Say, well, Pastor, why are you telling me this story? I'm telling you this story because I, I have reasons why I believe. 
Why in the world would I have told myself this? Why would I have said this to myself? I felt perfectly justified in hating my father. My father was one of the most abusive, psychologically abusive, horrible, hideous, narcissistic, demonic men I've ever known. My entire life, my father worked against my faith, folks. I kid you not. My father constantly would say things that was trying to dig away at the concept of God and dig away at faith in God and try to make us not believe in God and not believe in, in the gospel. My father was terribly abusive and nasty and rude and ignorant to my mother. He cheated on her every day of their marriage, and I knew he did. Even at 12 years old, I knew he did. And I'm going to tell you, so I hated that man's guts. I hated him worse than I hated anything in this world. And there I stood at the altar asking God to refill me with the Holy Ghost, to stir up the gift of God that was within me. And the Lord was telling me, Honey, the one thing that's holding up the show here is that bitterness and that hatred and that malice that you hold toward your father. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I said, okay, Lord, if that's all I have to do, then I give it up. I release it. And I literally, in my spirit, I, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I said, God, I release it. And I let go of that hatred. I, I just let it go. I just let it out of my hands. And Tommy, immediately, the Spirit of God, the power of God hit me like a ton of bricks. And I fell backwards on my back. I couldn't even stand up. The power of God hit me as power. And I was speaking in other tongues since the Spirit of God gave me the utterance. You can tell me that was just me talking to myself. But I'm going to tell you, that's one of the reasons I believe. And for those of you who think this Pentecostal business of speaking with other tongues is just a bunch of gibberish, and just a bunch of hype, and just a bunch of foolishness, I have a great aunt. She's now 93 years old. She's of German descent. My uncle and she met somewhere during the course of World War II. It took him an act of God in Congress to bring her back to the United States so they could marry and raise a family my aunt has been in the United Pentecostal Church, the One God Jesus Name Church, for decades. Many, many, many decades, going back probably to at least her late 20s, early 30s. My great aunt, I visited with her some months back while I was in Connecticut. I love this lady. She's a dear, sweet lady. And I had heard her testimony, but I had heard it secondhand. And this day she and I were sitting at her kitchen table and she began to share her testimony with me. I didn't ask her to. She just began to share it. And she said, CJ stands for Chuck Jr. A lot of my family called me CJ. Or she actually thinks she called me Chucky. Said, Chucky. She said, when your grandmother, who was born and raised Roman Catholic, when she got saved and became born again and came into the Pentecostal faith and received the gift of the Holy Ghost as did so many of your aunts and uncles who were just kids at the time that they received the Holy Ghost. She said, I began to go to church, but I was going to a Baptist church. And I went to my pastor and I asked him about that baptism of the Holy Ghost that your grandmother told me about. And that tongue talking that your grandmother told me. And that Baptist preacher informed me that that was of the devil. That was not real. That was not God. God didn't do that anymore. He did that in biblical times, but he didn't do that today. She said, but your grandmother invited me to church. She said, and I would go to church with her. She said, and... One particular day I went to church with your grandmother and there was a wonderful Christian lady in that church who was Italian. And her English was so broken. Now, you know, down to here in, uh, you know, Texas, uh, you don't get uh, to talk uh, to many uh, people who speak with the Italian accent. Up north where I come from, 
we have many, many, many Italian people, and I am very accustomed to speaking to people who have a very thick, very heavy Italian accent. My uncle Eddie actually married a woman who was from Italy who spoke with a very heavy Italian accent. And Aunt Betty said, this lady in the church spoke with a very thick, very heavy Italian accent. She said, and I was sitting there and I was asking God, God, I'm so confused. My pastor says one thing, and yet these people are so full of love and so full of grace and so full of the power of God, and their passion for you is so real and so wonderful. She said, I want to ask you, Lord, see, when you seek Him, when you ask Him, when you come to the table and reason, God will give you reasons to believe. She said, is this baptism of the Holy Ghost thing real? Or is it not real? Is it for me or is it not for me? She said, all of a sudden, this woman in the church who spoke English so poorly because of her Italian accent, and my Aunt Betty's telling me the story, and tears are literally streaming down her face as she's telling me the story, at 93 years old. She said, all of a sudden, this lady began to speak in perfect German. <laughs> and she began to glorify God in perfect German. She said, and Aunt Betty literally spoke the phrase that this woman began to say in German. She said, I remember to this day, she said, and I, I don't speak German, so I can't even begin to tell you, but my Aunt Betty spoke the phrase in German. She said, and this woman began to say this in German. She said, and I knew, <laughs> I knew this thing was real, because that lady couldn't even speak English, never mind German. She said, but she spoke German without a single accent, without a single issue. She spoke perfect German and was glorifying God in perfect German. I bet he said, there's a reason I believe. There's a reason I believe. Because God has revealed himself to me. Amen. God revealed himself to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. And I've got news for you today, children. God will reveal himself to you. If you'll dare ask him, if you'll talk to him, if you'll reason with him. Lord, give me a reason to believe. Give me a reason. Help me to understand it. I'm going to close with this. I remember as a kid, the church I grew up in had built a new church building. We were growing expeditiously, rapidly, and our church needed a new, bigger church building, and we built a new building. And the day that we were dedicating our new building, they put in the newspaper, you know, that our new church building was finished and we'd be dedicating it and we were going to have you know one of those ribbon cutting services at the front and so everybody's outside the entire congregation is outside and many hundreds of people came from the community Do you know it's a new church new building so a lot of people out of curiosity came you know and during the course of the celebration outdoors one of the members of our church gave a message in tongues, which is one of the gifts of the Spirit. And they gave a message, and when a message is given, that message is to be interpreted. And the pastor got on the microphone and he interpreted the message. Well, we wound up cutting the ribbon everybody went into the church and we sat in the church and we finished the service it was wonderful and after the service a lady came up to brother barlow and she said to brother barlow she said sir how long did you study hebrew and he said excuse me ma'am." she said well it's obvious that you're fluent in hebrew and he said, ma'am, uh, I, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. He said, I don't know Hebrew. She said, sure you do. So when we were outside, that man spoke in Hebrew. She said, and then you turned around and interpreted it perfectly, word for word. Exactly what he said. She said, I'm Jewish. She said, I just came today because she had a pretty new building, and I was curious, and I thought, oh, well, it would be nice to, 
experience this, you know, service. She said, but that man over there gave, shouted out in Hebrew, and you turned around, said, and you interpreted, you repeated back in English word for word what he said. Well, I'll tell you a little secret, folk. There are reasons, I believe. God has shown himself to me over and over again. There's an old song that says, look what the Lord hath done, look what the Lord hath done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. I'm going to praise his name. He's always just the same. Oh, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. Look what the Lord hath done. I can't even begin to tell you today how many times God has healed me in response to prayer. I cannot even begin to tell you today how many times God has given me peace in time of trouble that was nothing short of miraculous. When I should have been out of my mind with worry and anxiety, God just dropped peace in my spirit. I can't tell you how many times I've been healed. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people healed. I've seen crippled people whose limbs were so twisted, I've literally seen them stand up from wheelchairs, their limbs straightening out as they stood. I've seen it with my own eyes, people. This, this, ain't been, this isn't a Benny Hinn foolishness. This happened in a nursing home church service. Two women, both of them, twisted began to push themselves up out of their wheelchairs, and I watched their feet straighten, I watched their limbs straighten. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I've seen people who were told they would never walk again like Christopher Reeve after an accident, a woman I know after a diving accident, and she told the doctor, you don't know my God. She said, I'm going to walk again, and I watched Ruthie walk into our church when I was a kid. Don't tell me God ain't real. Don't tell me that I believe this thing without reason. Don't tell me that if I reasoned it out, that, that I would understand that this is a bunch of punk and a bunch of foolishness. No, people can find reasons to believe anything they want to. And in the end, what we believe and how we believe is our choice. I choose to believe. I choose to believe God's real. I choose to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. I choose to believe Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary and rose again on the third day. I choose to believe he's coming back one day for his church. I choose to believe there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. But I choose to believe these things not in absence of reason, but because... I have reasons to believe. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.